Hello there, welcome to another in the series of Talk Financials videos, looking at the accounts of um, various companies. Today, we're running the rule over Superdry. Um, that's uh, myself, Johnny, Johnny Wraith, and uh, as always, of course, Ted Wayman, looking through the accounts, giving us his insights into um, how this company is faring, how it's been doing recently, how we may expect it to do uh, over the coming period of time based on the, the strength of its accounts, um, a view on its share price, uh, where that's been, where it might be going next, uh, based obviously on the company's prospects and also a view on how the big wigs, the CEO um, and senior members of the board are remunerated. Um, as always, these are just our opinions. They're not formal investment advice, so please do take them as such. Um, uh, and, and Ted will take us through Superdry's accounts. This is a, a UK branded clothing company. Um, it's right. been around right. since 2003 um, and uh, it floated in 2010. Uh, the CEO, the founder, Julian Dunkerton, um, initially left the company in 2014 after some profit warnings. Um, and they had to put some opening plans on ice back in, in 2012. He then rejoined, interestingly, in 2019, um, virtually the entire board that was there when he came back um left shortly afterwards so there was a complete reinvention of the board of super dry under the um the the initial founder when he came back and then a couple of years ago in 2021 uh, there was a lot of speculation about the ability of super dry to continue as a going concern and at the time the board put out a slightly strange statement saying they had a reasonable expectation that the company could continue as a going concern for the foreseeable future so arguably a sort of lukewarm vote in its own um, uh, in its own abilities. But anyway, um, we'll see how they've been faring of late now. Um, have they recovered since he came back, since he took up the reins, since that speculation that they might be in trouble? Um, how do their uh, how do their accounts look? How are their um, their finances? Uh, so on that note, I'll hand over to Ted to take us through as usual. Thanks a lot, Johnny. Good to see you again. Welcome to our, well, welcome back to all of our subscribers. Uh, welcome to our new viewers. If you're our new viewer, if you're not a subscriber, then please do hit the subscribe button. Don't forget to like and share the video if you like what you see um, or hear. Uh, super dry. So we are looking at super dry. This is a recommendation from one of our subscribers, Josh Baird, who dropped me a message to say, just stumbled across you. Uh, I think stumbled across my YouTube channel uh, uh super drive be an interesting one at the moment so here we go josh this one is for you so without further ado let's go and have a look at their annual report and accounts this is the 2022 annual report and accounts um uh, and it is available on their website and uh, you'll see that there's lots of inf juicy information about the company who the board is what the strategy is and you know, ethical investing and and you know risk management and staff and all the kind of culture and, and you know and it go, I have to admit it does it does kind of go on for a while um uh so we're going to whiz all the way through that and we're going to get down to the numbers so here are the numbers and we are going to start with the income statement so we are dealing in millions of pounds um and uh there we go um uh, so we're looking at this sort of column here. Um, there's always quite often you you come across this one. Um, uh, we sort of have a sort of a net, you know, kind of the, the sort of the main and then a few adjustments um, uh, and they're all exceptional items sometimes called um, and, and exceptional items happen every single year. So um, I tend to kind of just, you know, ignore that and go straight for the um, for the total numbers. These guys turn over six hundred and nine million pounds. The cost of sales, that's the cost of the stuff they're selling. 267 so it's pretty high margin business 56 percent is their gross margin um so every time you spend i don't know 100 100 quid on a jacket um it's costing them uh, uh 44 pounds to to make and buy the jacket and they get to keep 56 um but then they do have a lot of overheads okay so this is all the shop staff uh, and the rent that they will pay on their stores fulfillment um on their sort of online uh etc etc um, so a little bit of other gains. And interestingly enough, if you didn't have those other gains, um, they'd be at break even. So those other gains effectively are driving um, uh, that profit figure. A um, little bit of finance, um, finance expense. Um, uh, and that leaves them with the profit before tax, 18 million. 
um, and they get a little bit of a tax refund, so 23 million. So, um, you know, bottom line is 4%, really, really tight. Um, and, you know, mainly driven by these other gains. Probably worth just having a quick look at note 11 to see what those other gains are. So what we're really interested in is you'll notice that it kind of happens every year. Can we rely on that going forward? So here we are with um, looking at our other gains uh, and there's a little bit of you know, foreign exchange. Um, there's some royalty income. I reckon that's probably uh, fairly consistent. Uh, and then lease modifications and terminations. So again, you know, that, that's, you know, these are not gonna be sustainable going forward. So when we look at the core operation of the business, we really need to be kind of ignoring um, things like those other gains and assuming that they're not going to happen on an ongoing basis. I mean, you know, there may be other things coming in there, but really, uh, and that's why it's kind of sitting um, slightly sort of down the um, uh, the income statement. Um, uh, and, and to a certain extent, we should really be kind of, you know, just cancelling that. So operating profit, we should really be kind of, you know, taking um, taking in here. Um, so, uh you know, at the, at the end of the day, it, it's, you know, so if you, if you take a sort of net effect of these two numbers together, um, you know, the core operating is they're still operating at a loss. Now we can see last year losses all over the place. You know, they were having a pretty, uh, a pretty torrid time uh, during the, um, the lockdown and COVID. Um, you know, they haven't recovered yet. They'll book a bottom line profit, but the core business is not yet profitable according to these numbers. Let's go and have a look at the balance sheet and see the kind of the strength of the company sitting behind them. So uh, property, plant and equipment and right of use assets. We can kind of just lump those two together. Quite a lot of intangibles. There'll be a little bit of goodwill in there, maybe some trademarks, software, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and a big deferred tax asset. Now, I don't know exactly how that um, has arisen. If we want a little bit more information, we can have a look at note 22. Um, a lot of inventory. Now, these guys are quite interesting. OK, so now remember, these guys are obviously a retailer. Um, so that inventory, my back of an envelope calculation suggests it takes them 200 days to sell the inventory. So they're holding inventory for a very long time. They've also got these accounts receivable. It's slightly strange to have those, you know, such a high accounts receivable because, you know, traditionally when I kind of buy a jacket, go in and you and you pay for it. So, um, you know, the overall accounts receivable, 33 days, which I thought was a little bit bizarre. Um, and then down the bottom on this page, you can just see the trade payables. Um, uh, and that suggests that, you know, again, back of an envelope calculation, um, it's about 97 days for their trade payables. So, you know, if you're if you're if it takes you 190 days to sell your inventory and another 33 days to collect the money in um, and you're paying out on day, you know, effectively uh, 100 for their creditors, um, uh, then their um, working capital requirement is around about 130 days based on those numbers. Um, and, and that puts a strain on their cash flow. So, um, you know, you know, they need capital in order to survive that from a from a cash flow perspective. And actually, if we look um, at the current assets, um, you know, they do have working capital, but, um, you know, it, it's don't underestimate their need for as much working capital as they can get their hands on. So they probably need a little bit more than that. Um, there's nothing else really kind of jumping out at us in these um in these accounts um you know they, they've got lease liabilities the big liabilities the lease liabilities uh, and those lease liabilities sit alongside these right of use assets you'll notice that you've kind of got the right of use assets um of only 80 million and then the lease liabilities um is actually fairly substantial um uh, compared to those and then they've got a little bit of debt um uh, sitting on there as well no debt the previous year so they've obviously, uh, you know, taken out a loan uh, to help with their financing. Um, uh, and then um, down the bottom, uh, here's the um, uh, the equity, um, uh, the equity, well, obviously, it's the is, is the uh, 103. Um, so it's about 100, 100 million uh, of equity, um, and a substantial amount of investment. Uh, and they do have these retained earnings, but then they've got this merge reserve. Now, this is very much an accounting adjustment based on, you know, when they when they're growing by buying um, other companies. 
So um, cash flow, uh, are they generating cash? So we've got um, the, the cash flows up the top here. So if you want to see the kind of reconciliation, you've got to go and have a look at note 32. They are generating cash, which is good. Um, a lot of that will be things like, you know, depreciation, um, which is now kind of coming through. A little bit of investment going on. Um, and then we can see here, this is kind of refinancing. So the ABL will be the uh, known as asset backed liability. So this will be, um, you know, a sort of a, a loan that they've got, uh, which is backed by the assets um, uh, and the net effect and a, and a lot of repayments of those leases. Um, so there's lots of financing going on. So if you're making 50 million uh, and you're spending 70 million investing in the business and another 53 million basically paying your leases, which is effectively what they're doing, then you're going to have less cash than you started with. OK, and so that's putting downward pressure on their cash. So these guys are not out of the woods yet in terms of their cash flow. Their, you know, their, their working capital is being strained by the kind of you know, the longevity with which they hold their um, inventory, for example, up from 100. Uh, 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 so it's, it's coming down from previous years. Um, uh, so it was over 200 days in um, uh, 2021. Um, you know, and 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 that together with this um uh, this sort of this financing um I think is you know the financing of the leases is causing uh, you know a fair amount of uh, challenges. So that's kind of the account. It's you know it's 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 not all roses yet by any means. Um, so if we go and see how the company has been performing. Um, uh, in terms of their share price, here we have a, a look at the kind of, you know, since they floated. So um, if you're an investor, uh, if you've held on to your shares, then you've you've probably got more gray hairs than Johnny and me put together. Um, but, you know, you've kind of gone all the way up and all the way back down again and then all the way up and then sort of, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it really has been, you know, quite a kind of roller coaster ride um, of peaks and then really just comes all the way down. There's the pandemic. Um, uh, and then sort of starting to tick up. Uh, and I think um, uh, we said that um, uh, uh, our, our, our friend was back, uh, uh, Julian was back round about 2019, I think you said, Johnny. So kind of, you know, here um, uh, and it just carried on going down and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of gone sideways. I mean, if we kind of zoom in a little bit sort of closer on what it looks like more recently, you know, it's got right down to the bottom and it's just it's just going sideways. It's, it's really not going anywhere. It's the value, 99 million. So basically it's 100 million. Um, don't forget the um, uh, the balance sheet is um, uh, about 104 million. Um, so they are actually trading at below book value. So this is the theory. Uh, and just uh, to reiterate that, um, let's just go back to the um, so the, the the this this number here, this net asset value, which is the same as the equity. This is the net asset value. So in theory, and obviously I emphasize the word theory, you could buy this company for 99 million, sell off the assets, pay off the liabilities. You'd end up with 104 million. You're going to make a profit of about five million. OK, don't do that because it's not going it, to you know, it's a theoretical number, um, but it does mean that it's trading at below what we call book value. Um, and therefore, the P ratio is is pretty high. Um, you know, it's it's you know, I've got 15 times earnings on the screen here. My calculation is that, you know, if you're going to make a 23 million profit, it's a four four point three eight times earnings four four times earnings. Yet most of other gains and losses it's it's you know it's core business is trading at a loss um and i think that is causing uh, a few issues there so you know we can almost take that p ratio and just say look if they're if they're trading at a, at a kind of you know they're not actually making a profit or a loss we can take that out um they're trading at book value you know is it is it is it is it a business you want to own is it a business you want to short? You know, quite frankly, I've absolutely no idea. And I'm not a big one on retail, I have to admit, because I don't really get retail. The kind of the fickle world of fashion um, is kind of more um, uh, than I than I kind of, you know, you know, more than I can sort of fathom. Um, so, yeah, I, the, the, the simple answer is, you know, I don't know whether it's a, it's, it's, it's a it's a it's a good opportunity or not. Um, uh, it's not a screaming buy. I'm not sure it's a screaming sell either. I think it's a screaming, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, 
so let's just finish with um julian um our friend uh, and see how he is being remunerated for um running this business so if we uh, have a look on page 122 of this document um, we can see the remuneration of the board uh and um uh we go here we go so single single number here we go um uh, and the total pay um of the uh, of julian there he is um so total pay is 635 so he's getting 635,000 up from just shy of 600,000 in the previous year that's about a 7% pay increase um we can compare that to the employees of super dry so um the uh, the staff expenses are, are on page 172 of this document so we can find that uh, here it is, page 172. Um, we can see uh, the the total number of employees. So there's 200 and uh, basically two and a half thousand employees, a little bit down from 2021, uh, and they're being paid 95 million, which is a little bit up from 2021. So average pay based on those numbers suggests. Uh, that last year um, they were being paid about 29,000 was the average salary and this year it's gone up to 38,000. Now that's quite a big increase of 31% um, and it means that the CEO is being paid about 17 times the average salary, a little bit down from 20 times the average salary in the previous year. Now, um, you know, there's going to be some people who are kind of part-time and, and, and paid much less and some people who are going to be paid much more, um, but average salary, 38,000, which is around about the UK average, I think. I bet 33,000, I think, is the UK average. So, um, you know, it doesn't seem, you know, too unreasonable that. So, um, you know, not, not, not an excessive amount of pay for the um, chief executive. And I think Julian, you know, is, is very much kind of, you know, back at the helm and, and proving that, you know, he can, you know, bounce it back, kind of do a Steve Jobs, I guess. Um, you know, remember Steve Jobs, you know, was at Apple, kicked out, came back and then kind of rescued it and, and you know, took it off to a, you know, a trillion dollar company, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of what Julian is up to. So there you go, Johnny. That is my analysis of Superdry. Um, in, from an investment point of view, I have absolutely no idea. It's not in my portfolio. I'm not sitting here thinking, go, I've got to really fill my boots with it. Um, it's it's kind of, you know, it is what it is. I, but I don't think, it, you know, fundamentally, it's not making a profit yet. Certainly not on those 2022 figures. And, and there's, right. I think there's still a way to go before they start to justify um, that value. So it's very much driven by book value, I think, rather than necessarily by earnings at the moment. Yeah, well, you're you're um, you're absolutely right about them not making a profit. It was actually I'm just looking at some sort of more recent developments at Superdry, and they actually issued a profit warning about ten days ago. They'd previously been looking um, for profit of ten to twenty million, or, or um, indicating profit of ten to twenty million on their guidance. They're now forecasting that they'll break even this year, so no profits at all. There's been speculation that uh, Mr. Dunkerton might take Superdry private. He does own about 24% of the shares, incidentally. Um, but he uh, came out and formally confirmed that he has no plans to do that at the moment, which, as you'll be aware, Ted, means under UK takeover rules that he now can't bid for Superdry for, for six months unless um, responding to another offer or he has an agreement with the board. So he's had to respond to that speculation following the profit warning, um, which you probably won't be surprised to hear, was all attributed to our old friend, COVID uncertainty uh, and, and obviously, you know, the recent cost of living crisis and the pressure on consumers uh, with consumer spending coming under, uh, you know, so much uh, uh, threat over recent months has all contributed to that. So perhaps not surprising to see the share price flatlining. In fact, if you sort of zoomed in um, just on the last year, you'd see it's actually down about 40 percent in the last year, albeit it's basically been sort of going sideways um, for some considerable time. So. Yeah, not much to, to write home about there, I, I suspect. And as you say, it's it's sort of at these levels, you probably wouldn't want to be going short of it. There isn't a great deal of um, of scope to, to benefit from that. But equally, it's hard to see a compelling reason to expect it to start heading rapidly in the other direction. So um, so there we go. Um, do you, do, does 
Does that sort of surprise you? I guess it doesn't. You said you're not a retail expert. I know that you're actually the last word in fashion, even if you won't say it yourself. But uh, <laughs> does that surprise you to see um, a profit warning and the, and the sort of speculation about them being taken private? It, it doesn't really surprise me, I've got to say. I don't, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I, I guess, you know, if you're going to take someone private, then, you know, Julian's got to, you know, he's got to raise the funds. So he's got to find, he's got to find some backers. Um, and whether that's a P company or whether he, you know, he, he puts debt on there, but debt's becoming more expensive. So it doesn't surprise yeah. me. I mean, if I was sitting in my private equity office and he knocked on my door and said, you know, I need, you know, you know, you say he's got 20%. So he says, I need 75 million to take this company private. I'd go, well, you know, don't come, you know, I, I, I'm not really interested in it. I can't see where the returns are coming. I, it, it's not, it just doesn't have that kind of that, that screaming kind of, you know, there's a great opportunity. It's kind of, it's slightly, it, it is what it is. You know, it's yeah. kind of, you know, it, it's all right. You know, it's just ticking along. Um, I'm not sure what his plans are as to, you know, his expansion plans, you know, how to sort of take it to the next level. But, you know, he's, you know, he's, he's carrying a lot of cost. You know, the item itself is, is, um, you know, you know, he's making a decent retail margin on the actual item. I mean, some of them are up, up at about 70 percent. Uh, Gymshark, for example, 70 percent. So 56 percent is kind of on the lower side of that. Um, but that that's the world of retail. But he's carrying that massive overhead, um, which is, you know, going to be things like store rent, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, and, and, and all the costs of, you know, of, of managing those stores. And, you know, does he take it online? And therefore, do you miss the kind of, you know, I, the honest answer is I don't know. I mean, uh, and you know, like anything, these kind of, you know, these these brands can be, you know, very desirable one year uh, and then suddenly can less desirable the next year. So how he navigates that, I, I think, you know, the person to ask is not me, but someone like Wolfson from mum um, from Next, who seems to be doing a pretty good job of, uh, of, of you know, steering a retail company. Cool. Well, thanks, Ted. Um, anyone else got any views on um, anything they've just heard or, or has heard any other of these sort of rumours and stories about uh, Julian Duncan, exactly as you suggested, Ted, holding meetings with private equity companies, perhaps sounding them out on whether any of them might like to, to help him take the company private. It's all, you know, lots of rumours swirling around. So if you know anything, if you heard anything, you share the views, you disagree with anything Ted said, please do add your comments, share the, the, the video as well. Do subscribe to, to the channel for, for more analyses along these lines. And um, uh, on that note, thanks very much, Ted. See you next time. Catch you later, Johnny. Cheers, mate. Hello, thank you for watching that video and I hope you found its content useful. If you want to know more about what we do here at Talk Financials, you can find out on talkfinancials.com uh, where we uh, will explain how we design, develop and deliver training workshops for companies all over the world. Uh, we've worked with over 300 companies in over 35 countries around the world, uh, helping them to understand financial statements, to understand uh, business finance and to become fluent in the language of business finance. Uh, if you're interested in, in developing your own skills in how you read and interpret financial statements, um, I, I've developed an online workshop uh, which is available. All you've got to do is click on the QR code there, uh, point your camera at the QR code, um, and that will take you through to an online workshop uh, and it will help you to improve your own ability to read and interpret financial statements. Uh, I've also written a book called How to Talk Finance. Uh, and again, that is available. Um, if you click on the QR code, it'll take you through to the Amazon website where you can buy the book either as a hard copy or as a Kindle edition. Um, and that's really everything from me. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, it'd be great to stay in touch. If you'd like to contact me, um, then again, just click on the QR code um, uh, and send me a message. Uh, and good luck with uh, your financial analysis. I hope it goes well.